The webinar tonight is uh, Perinatal Mental Health, Working Better, Working Together. This webinar is presented by MHPN. The panel tonight are Dr. Morton Rowland, Professor Brianne Barnett, Professor Jeanette Milgram, and Ms. Stacey Noble. Morton is a GP, Brianne is a psychiatrist, Jeanette is a psychologist, and Stacey is a consumer. I am your facilitator, Michael Murray. This webinar is hosted by MHPN. It is a Commonwealth-funded project supporting the development of sustainable interdisciplinary collaboration in the local primary mental health sector across Australia. We currently support over 450 local interdisciplinary mental health networks. For more information, go to mhpn.org.au. The learning objectives tonight. At the end of this session, participants will be able to better recognize the early warning signs of perinatal mental health issues, better recognize the core principles of and pathways to effective treatment and management of perinatal mental health issues, better understand the merits, challenges, and opportunities in providing collaborative care to people experiencing perinatal mental health issues. To find out more about your discipline's CPD recognition, please visit mhpn.org.au. The webinar is comprised of two parts. We will have a facilitated interdisciplinary panel discussion and a question and answer session fielded from the audience. So please feel free to put questions up in the message box on the right-hand side, and we will keep an eye on those and present them to your panel during, um, during the evening. So the ground rules are that I will moderate the panel discussion and field questions from the audience. You can all submit questions for the panel by typing them in the message box. You can also minimize that message box if you're finding it distracting using the arrows. And if your specific questions are not addressed, or if you want to continue the discussion, feel free to participate in a post-webinar online forum on MHBN online. If you require technical support during the evening, please call 1-800-733-4166. Ensure that the sound is on and the volume is turned up on your home computers for all participants. This does not apply to the panel. If you're experiencing problems with sound, dial, dial that number. If you're having bandwidth issues, sound or internet lagging or dropping out, you can minimize this by clicking on the presenter's webcams and pressing the pause button under their video screen. You will still be able to hear the presenters when you pause their webcams. Webinar recording and PowerPoint slides will be posted on MHPN's website within 48 hours of the live activity. Again, for technical support, call 1-800-733-416. Now, we're going to hear from our consumer rep, Stacy Noble. Stacy will present uh, her presentation now. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks, Michael. Hi everyone and thank you for joining myself and the other panel members this evening. Um, I hope that, that you enjoy the session and, um, and get a lot out of it. Um, antenatal depression, which is, as you're probably all aware, uh, depression during the pregnancy period from conception through to birth. And approximately 10% of pregnant women in Australia experience antenatal depression. And postnatal depression, which is the period from birth uh, following um, the birth of the baby is, has almost 16% of women um, in Australia experiencing postnatal depression. And I actually fell into both of those categories with my second child, um, basically suffering antenatal depression from conception through to uh, postnatal depression, which lasted for approximately three months uh, following the birth of my baby. Uh, perinatal depression does not discriminate. Um, it can and it does affect women and their families across different cultures, age groups and from different social, professional and financial positions. Through my own experience and through my work as a counsellor with the Post and Antenatal Depression Association, I have seen the impact of perinatal mental health on not only the affected woman but her partner, other children in the family, family and friends. 
quite often a woman will present by saying that she knows that there's something wrong but she just can't work out what it is. She doesn't feel herself. Um, likewise, I often hear from the partners of these women that they can't do a thing right. Everything that they try to do is wrong and they really have no knowledge or they don't have the skills to be able to identify that there's actually a problem. What ends up, ends up happening is that they, they put it down to a lack of sleep and it's simply the demands of being a new mum. Quite often this can reach a crisis point um, and at this point it throws the whole family into turmoil. This is often the family's first point of contact in regards to the woman's decline in health which quite possibly has, has been beginning to happen over a long period of time. And at this point, when it does reach crisis point, um, there's quite often a need for the woman to be admitted as an inpatient. Many times the partner is struggling with his own transition to parenthood and he often feels quite low himself. And then he finds himself in the unlikely position of having to support his wife emotionally and quite often the other children that may be in the family also. Thanks, Michael. Thanks very much, Stacey. That was a lovely presentation, and it, it's a really good introduction to our work tonight. Uh, Morton, um, I'd like you to start your presentation now, if you, if you may. Thanks, Michael. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. Morton, uh, may I just ask you just to move the microphone a little bit closer? Thank you. Okay. Maybe speak up a little bit. Is that any better? That's, that's much better. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, this is a really important issue in mental health. Um, as Stacey said, a uh, very large percentage of um, women do suffer from perinatal uh, depression, and I think it's absolutely important for us to recognise that it actually does start from conception. Uh, and then you've also got the, the postnatal perspective, which in sort of traditional terms, the, the postnatal depression was the, the one that most of us were taught about, um, but it's actually much bigger than that. Um, there is a spectrum of severity. Certainly in my years of general practice, I think most mothers will have a degree of anxiety and the uh, pregnancy blues. Um, most are mild, um, but like any of these um, uh, problems, there is a, a great spectrum of the severity to the, the very severe where uh, people are thinking and contemplating of suicide and uh, more particularly harming uh, their children as well. Um, and those are the sort of things that we're aiming to try and uh, prevent, obviously. Um, one of the problems with, with uh, perinatal and postnatal depression is that it often, in my experience, presents a little bit late, um, often with the person uh, very much... Uh, feeling guilty, um, why is this happening to me, it all should be perfect, um, well, you know, life isn't always like that and it's, uh, it's important for us to uh, uh, recognise that we need to be very supportive. Um, the approaches that are important um, are that uh, we need to move uh, people to discuss their problems um, and certainly listening empathetically, um, not sympathetically uh, only, but listening and, and actually hearing what people are saying is really important. Um, Open-ended questions uh, which are important and in actual fact don't increase the time of your consultation uh, markedly, um, if you look at the research, uh, are really helpful in this case and you'll actually usually get more information uh, with open-ended questions. 
I think it's really important in this situation that we remember that there's quite often some social isolation uh, occurring here as well. Whether the, uh, it's because mum and baba are at home or uh, whether the uh, process, particularly with the first baby, you know, not enough help around um, and it's important to remember that that's, a, that's something that you can actually work on to help. Um, I can't emphasize strongly enough that, you know, suicide can occur. Um, so it is not something to be taken lightly and acknowledging that the person isn't feeling good about themselves and they are having problems is really an important thing and not just to say, they're there, it'll be okay. Um, from the general practice perspective, some of the things that can be done by the GP, apart from actually listening and recognising that there's a problem and potentially helping uh, that person to get to the uh, other health professionals within our network uh, to help them specifically, but actually to help that person to goal set. Um, small cues uh, and small wins each day are often really helpful um, and giving them uh, some tasks that they've agreed are helpful um, is often a very important thing. Um, contracts with the patient, particularly in the more severe uh, forms, I always find is really helpful. Um, you know, if you're feeling like this, you can contact me or the crisis team in your state or contact your mother or, you know, it needs to be worked out with the patient, but it's a safety net. Um, I've also found that often more, almost more important than some of the things that are actually said are the non-verbal cues. Um, how mum actually comes into the room, um, how they're dressed, how uh, mum and baby are interacting, and uh, also how the family unit uh, is acting with the partner uh, or mother-in-law or mother, whoever's coming with, with mum and bub. It's important to get that vibe if you can. Um, and I think the other thing that I've learnt uh, over the years that's really important here is to remember that the mother and baby are a coupled group and sometimes some of the things that you would perhaps suggest to somebody who has a depression or an anxiety not associated with the perinatal and postnatal um, period, in other words, you know, leave what's stressing you and go out and have a, a night on the, uh, with your partner having a, uh, a dinner or something, uh, may not be actually possible with young babies and uh, you have to be realistic in uh, helping uh, mum with your um, counselling. So I might leave it there and hand over to Mike again. Thank you very much Morton, that was a, that was a very very good uh, presentation. Um, we're now just going to move on to um, Brianne Barnett's uh, presentation. She, she's requested that we, that we, before we put her slides up, she, she just speaks uh, to the audience first. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, and thank you, Morton. I think we have to have you cloned immediately. <laughs> However, now let's just begin. I haven't had the opportunity as yet to discuss her story with Stacy, so I'm taking up the position of the psychiatrist, who is her first contact when she calls the hospital after Jake's arrival. And because I trust um, all those hundreds of you out there implicitly, I'm going to tell you how my mind works under these circumstances. But 
Stacy has contacted our hospital psychiatric mother baby unit. She's been a patient here before, after the birth of Madison, and she wants help again now. So we arrange for her husband to bring her and Jake to the hospital and leave Madison with Stacy's mother. Here is the story as I might have seen it at the time, and I'm pondering about it. Stacy is a 36-year-old woman at this stage. She's been married for eight years to Wayne, and they have two children, a girl aged three or four, Madison, and a baby boy aged five weeks, Jake. The latter was a planned pregnancy, but she felt unwell throughout, and his being a boy was a problem. He slept poorly, had severe reflux, and has a strong personality. So I think this is a distressed baby, but I'm glad to say he hasn't given up hope of getting the help he needs. Assisted, I hope, by reading the notes from her previous admission, I now want to know from both of them what their current difficulties are. Despite help from Wayne and her mother, Stacy is obviously going under, and prolonged sleeplessness is certainly a major health hazard. I need exact details about the insomnia, and I need to know about her mood over the course of the day and her anxiety and panic attacks. What is she worried about? Does she have any intrusive thoughts about harm to herself, her partner, or the baby? And I want to know about her weight and appetite and so on. Also, it is important to discover whether there are any signs of loss of touch with reality. In other words, is this a psychotic illness? I also want to know about the pregnancy and the delivery and how her health has been physically since then. Her cry for help alone is enough to make me think I'd like her to be in hospital for observation at least over the next short time. So admission of mother and baby are arranged and Wayne will visit daily with Madison as appropriate and the staff are instructed to ensure that mother and baby are fed and tucked into bed with sedation for Stacy if required. Over the following days, I need a lot more information from Stacy, and I need at some stage to talk in depth to Wayne and to her mother because they may also need help. For example, is Wayne managing, or is he also depressed and anxious? Did his own mother perhaps have similar problems, and he found it hard to deal with them? Daisy's mother certainly had similar problems, and I need to give her a chance to talk about them. I will also need to make sure little Madison is supported, as I do not want in another 20 years to find another anxious, potentially depressed woman in this family. This comprehensive plan will co require collaboration, and no one person can provide all that's required to help Stacy and her family. I will be pulling in many team members. Now, could we have the first slide? Thank you. So some of the missing information, what and why, and there are lots and lots of questions that I will need to have answered before I can possibly put together a plan to help Stacy and the family. The second slide. The previous hospital admission, what was, what was the diagnosis? And it followed an extended period of sleep deprivation. Uh, what exactly did that involve? And what else uh, happened over that period of time? Was she repeatedly perhaps at her GP, worried about the baby's health or something else of this nature? What was the diagnosis? Postnatal depression is a pretty useless diagnosis. It can cover such a lot of different things. What was the treatment? I suppose it, we have to say it was helpful because Stacy has applied to the same hospital again. But was the diagnosis adequate and was the treatment adequate is what I'm wondering. And of course, were the couple warned to obtain help early in her next pregnancy because an illness serious enough to have the mother in hospital is likely to recur in the next pregnancy. And I, um, I would imagine that someone tried to tell them about this and how they could deal with that. Next slide. After discharge, what was offered to Stacy and the family to enhance their resilience? This is a woman who's been anxious and depressed most of her life. We could, if we intervene now, help her to become more resilient in the future. We can offer her ongoing therapy for herself. We can offer couple therapy. We can offer mother-infant relationship work. And, and all of this, I would expect our mental health nurses or psychologists to take on. I want to know if medication and other treatments were offered 
and were they acceptable to Stacy? What side effects did she have and what did she find uh, useful? Next slide. Other things that I'm thinking about at this time before I've um, even seen Stacy is how, how is it that she wasn't identified and helped during either pregnancy? Um, given that in the public system at least we have mandatory sets of psychosocial questions and depression and anxiety screening and so on, all of which goes on antenatally, how is it that Stacy slipped through the net? How is it that she doesn't seem to be able to tell health professionals when she's not well? Has she always had to solve her own problems? Is it that she needs approval from people and she tries to be a perfectionist and therefore when things are going wrong, she feels bad about herself and feels it's all her fault? And this is a problem that many women have. And I'm wondering, the next slide please, What else is going on here? When Stacy herself was born, was her mother depressed and anxious? Was her mother very ill when her sister was born? Because stacy has been anxious, she says, since around the age of four, which I would have thought was around the time her sister was arriving. And I need details of what happened in adolescence when she got depressed. And I wonder why her father and sister are not mentioned for any grandparents. She notes that Jake has a very strong personality and I'm wondering whether uh, her sister is a bit like this or perhaps her father. And she says, and this is clearly something that's very important for her, someone's hungry and I'm wondering who's hungry, hungry for what and what do they want from whom. There clearly are a lot of bits of information that, that I will need to be able to put together a package that will help Stacy and her family. Thank you very much, Brian. That was a that was a very good presentation, uh, and you certainly uh, raised some questions which many of us would have thought about, but some which we wouldn't have. Thank you very much. That was was very nice. Now we'll have we'll have we'll hear from Jeanette Milgram, um, our psychologist. Um, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to be here and uh, with uh, an audience out there and also with my colleagues, uh, Brian and Morton. Um, it's great to be talking in this multidisciplinary way. And um, Stacey, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist. I was asked to um, react to your story um, with some thoughts from a psychology perspective. And so what I've done is um, covering some thoughts that come both from my knowledge in the field, from um, my um, decades of research in the area, as well as from my clinical um, uh, work and how I would um, be thinking about what's happened to you, Stacey. Mm -hmm. Of course, as Brian says, you know, it, it's a very short snippet and there would be many more questions I too would like to know, but I've done my best um, with information I have. So uh, as I started reading your story, Stacey, um, I started thinking, well, um, it might be helpful to think about um, what led to species um, depression. Um, and uh, we find that uh, a very useful way of thinking about what triggers depression is a biopsychosocial model. And um, our best understanding is that um, a combination of biological, psychological, social, and historical factors combine in an individual often to tip the balance into postnatal depression. And um, we can understand from Tracy's brief story that there are some vulnerabilities that have been identified as very important predisposing factors. So um, Stacey talks about her mother's history of anxiety and her own personal history of depression and anxiety. And the big five um, of, of risk factors, and doesn't mean that that's the only one, but are our um, previous history of depression. And particularly also, um, I'm wondering whether there were any hints in pregnancy with Madison even, because antenatal depression and anxiety can predispose women. So we now encourage people to start looking in pregnancy, not just wait till the birth. Major life events. Um, lack of support or low partner support, that didn't seem to be an issue in Stacey's story, and um, previous depression histories, the other of the big five. So there were two of the big five there in the snippet. 
And um, and so Stacy, what was uh, quite striking was that Stacy did not seem to have received treatment from a psychologist for previous episodes of uh, depression that she had had or anxiety since the age of four, which might have helped her develop coping skills and perhaps deal um, in future when she noticed these symptoms recurring. I could have the next slide, thanks. Uh, like Brian, I was quite interested that Stacy did not disclose her anxiety and panic attack after the birth of Madison. But we know that's not at all unusual. That is a very, very common story. And so uh, professionals such as yourselves working in the field need to be very um, aware of reasons behind this to best support and encourage women um, in the perinatal period. And I imagine, Morton, when women come to your general practice, they may present with other things rather than directly with how they're feeling. And, um, and we know that there are many reasons why women find it difficult to disclose, um, living up to other people's expectations, fear, stigma, and many others. However, when we're talking about risk factors and difficulties, we also, when we, when I, when we work with individuals, take a, 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 a good look at what are the strengths and protective factors and from the Story. I can see that Stacey, you know, has um, obviously achieved a lot. She's a school teacher. She's managed to be productive. Um, she's got a confidence even when she was having difficulties with Madison in her strategies. She has sought help. Um, it obviously was faster after Jake, but that's a, a terrific um, strength and, and had a, has a supportive partner. But, but despite this, it wasn't until Madison was five months that Stacey felt she needed an admission. And so um, I guess that we're now working very much with our multidisciplinary colleagues who might see um, pregnant and postnatal women before they come to a psychologist to um, engage in screening exercises because many women um, do not make it very obvious that they're depressed. Um, they may present looking um, from the outside okay. And so I guess I'm asking the question, you know, where along the line and which professionals did Stacey come into contact with where screening uh, for depression and anxiety could have helped earlier? And there we usually turn to maternal and child health nurses and GPs who can play such an important role. Can I have the next slide? Thanks. So um, who can screen for depression? Um, Anybody can, and I guess that we're also moving not just from looking at professionals who come into contact with women around in the perinatal period, but families who become aware that of what the symptoms of depression are. And uh, many of you have probably heard of the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, which is being used as a very user-friendly, almost icebreaker 10 question, which raises uh, the profile of distress when it's there. And in that context, um, anyone who, who, who gets a hint that there are symptoms of depression and anxiety needs to also consider what else should I be asking? What else do I need to understand about this woman who is telling me that, they, that she has some signs of distress? So um, there are much broader assessment um, areas that one needs to cover, obviously, to get the full perspective of Stacey's story, as Brian so elegantly covered. And um, the Beyond Blue Clinical Practice Guidelines um, provide a, a very nice guideline on that. And there's also a, a very nice online training program that we've been involved with in developing on the website for learning how to screen and recognize signs of depression and anxiety. And it's free right on the Beyond Blue website. But I guess that I would expect all professionals working in this area to be very familiar with the symptoms of depression um, such as DSM-4 criteria. So that's um, um, right off, as, as Brian was saying, I'd like to know more about you know, how she's been feeling, whether she's had depressed mood, loss of interest, weight appetite, sleep, psychomotor, fatigue, worthless, feelings of worthlessness, guilt, indecision. And importantly, we always, um, as Morton said, want to be very aware of the possibility of uh, suicidal ideation and to immediately um, engage in a risk assessment um, process if that seems to be the case. Can I have the next slide, thanks? So, um, given Stacey's experience with Madison, um, 
like Brian, I wondered about um, what um, what psychopreventive support she was given in her second pregnancy. Um, was anyone alerted to the fact that she had had a difficult period with Madison and therefore with Jake she was likely to have some difficulty? Um, was Stacey's ambivalence over um, giving birth to a boy you know, related to her self-efficacy and anxiety? I'm starting to raise questions that might be relevant to some of the directions that we might um, engage in if we decide to um, go down the line of psychological treatment. And, and um, like Brian, I would have liked to have seen that the initial um, um, effort that, uh, and the good gains that Stacey no doubt had by being in the mother-baby unit were followed by, um, um, by um, post-discharge help. And Stacey may have found psychological treatment um, very helpful both to deal with um, historical problems and, um, and also um, her current issues. So um, it was great that Stacey acted quickly in seeking help with Jake and sought another mother-baby unit admission, but what would help her after discharge? And if I could have my last slide. Um, well, I guess that what comes to my mind is that um, depressive symptoms and underlying anxiety have been long-standing for Stacey. Um, and so uh, that would be a very strong focus, not only to deal with the current episode, but to look forward and to see how one could help her develop coping skills um, by perhaps some um, um, cognitive behavioral strategies um, if she was um, um, wanting to work in that way so that um, focused psychological strategies are, are, are very important um, and there certainly is a lot of evidence that CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal psychotherapy are very effective for new mothers. Um, I think that um, as I do in my own work and in my, our clinic, um, it needs to be however tailored to new mums. Like you can't have a mother doing relaxation for 20 minutes three times a day when you've got a toddler and a baby. And so for instance, what we do is we teach relaxation on the run, how to sort of learn um, ways that fit in with being a new mother. Um, as uh, Brian said, we need to mobilize the family and partner support. That is just so important. Um, as well as giving the partner support, as Stacey and Brian said, that um, it's a family issue and everybody gets accepted, uh, affected. Um, Mother-baby issues may also arise. It doesn't with all women, but uh, when it does, it's very distressing for both mothers and babies where the depression has gotten in the road of um, a joyful interaction. And what's so rewarding is that intervention um, uh, results in uh, the ability to reconnect and re-establish um, relationships when uh, depression has occurred. But these need to be targeted in their own right. So these are just some thoughts about um, where to go and, um, and, and what I thought when I read your story, Stacey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeanette. That was a, that was a very, very interesting presentation and it's raised many issues. And Many of our participants um, throughout Australia have, have commented um, before and during your presentation on many of those same points. But um, we should, as we're all consumer orientated, I, I think we should hear again from Stacy. See, if, Stacy, would you be willing to to add in some perspectives on, on what you've heard tonight and and your experiences as well during your pregnancy and postnatally? Yeah, absolutely, um, Michael. Um, I just wish that um, Jeanette and Brian had have been around for me when I was experiencing this because uh, what you two ladies have mentioned um, this evening would have made such an incredible difference um, to my whole experience and um, even just hearing it without being actively involved in your, your treatment and care, I know that I would have benefited um, hugely. So um, to wrap up and basically um, to look at the care that I received into, in comparison to the, the treatments that you ladies would have provided, 
um, was that I basically had um, no screening from my GP. Um, my initial consultation with my GP was to confirm my pregnancy and my next um, consultation with, with anyone at all was some 12 to 14 weeks later when I had my first obstetrician appointment. And it was during this period um, that I was at my absolute worst, um, suffering nausea, completely isolating myself, um, and basically reaching crisis point where I was contemplating uh, termination and I was also um, considering what I could do um, to myself as a way of, of releasing myself from this situation. Um, I, I think that, you know, had I been screened at that initial GP appointment, uh, where there were, in fact, um, details and a past history of my experience of being in a mother and baby unit with Madison um, and also, um, you know, a history of my, my mental health. Um, but this, this question was never, never asked. So that period for me was particularly difficult. And by the time I actually had my obstetrician appointment, I was probably through the worst, but... Um, and being at that point in time, the fact that I had improved slightly um, meant that um, that prevented me from then saying anything because I felt that, that the worst was over, despite going on to have um, a very unwell and um, extremely emotionally draining remainder of the pregnancy. Um, I, you know, as I said, having been assessed, I think, I, I really think it should be routine that with any uh, woman who presents to her GP, to confirm a pregnancy, um, to, to check whether she's pregnant. I think that there should be a routine uh, mental health history completed, um, regardless of whether the GP feels that, you know, this might upset the woman or, or is intrusive. I really think that this intervention and this question needs to be asked very early on in the piece. Um, I truly believe that if I had had um, intervention at that point, um, as the, the ladies have said, that I, that I would have been able to get through that pregnancy and I think that when my baby was born I would have had um, a much more beautiful experience and perhaps not um, experienced the postnatal depression that I did. I think for me when um, I did reach the point of um, entering the mother and baby unit I was extremely lucky that I responded well to the medication um, as you probably have all read from my story, um, I was actually discharged from the mother and baby unit um, in perhaps a worse position than I was when I was admitted. My um, Edinburgh postnatal depression score was in fact higher upon discharge than it was um, upon admission. And so I actually left the hospital um, in, quite, um, in quite an anxious state um, I was just fortunate enough that I managed to um, to bump into my psychiatrist, who was in fact a, a registrar at the time, um, so was, was very dedicated and very interested in what was going on for me. Um, and she, she responded in, in the only way that she could because my bed had already been filled. Um, she increased my medication and she ordered my husband to take um, carer's leave and she presented that option to him as basically being non-negotiable. So, you know, at that point on that particular day, she really made a big difference. Um, I went home, I had my husband with me for that week, um, which got me through possibly um, that very, um, the, the tender stage where I was still waiting for that medication to kick in. Um, and I think by the time he'd returned to work, within perhaps a week or so, um, the medication had reached its, um, its full potential and there really was a 360 degree turnaround and I think that medication actually um, treated the, the anxiety and the depression that I in fact um, lived with my whole life. So I think, you know, in, in hindsight and in looking back on my situation, it was extremely fortunate that I did respond so well to the medication because the, um, the follow-up care and um, the, the treatment that, and the options that were provided uh, for me were really um, non-existent. And I think the important thing to note too is that when a mum is extremely unwell, um, it's, 
it was impossible for me to access any resources or any information that I was provided with. I literally needed the hospital um, or medical professionals to make those links for me, to make the phone calls for me, to basically to do everything. I wasn't capable of being given information and being able to respond to that. So um, I look at myself as being one of the lucky ones, um, but I really think that there was a huge gap in, in the care that I received and the possible outcome um, and the length that, that my illness could have gone on for. So um, I always have, you know, fully supported the, the absolute need for early intervention. It's, it's crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. That was, uh, as somebody has commented, um, uh, that was a that was a very courageous presentation, and um, we, as as uh, practitioners, we we very much appreciate your your input tonight. Thank you. Um, Morton, I believe you have a question for Jeanette around collaboration between GPs and psychologists. Yes, yeah, thanks, Michael. I, one of the things that uh, I'd like to talk with Jeanette about is. What sort of uh, psychological approaches uh, would be of benefit and how can we better collaborate with um, our psychology and mental health nurse um, colleagues uh, to uh, help in this situation? Thanks, Morton. Um, I think it's a, it's a great question um, and the very question itself, sort of um, that openness of um, thinking, well, how can we all, uh, you know, use the resources that exist in the community, GP, nurse, psychologist, psychiatrist, and bring them together? And I think talking to each other is terribly important. You know, I, I often experience um, some <clears throat> women who go to their maternal child health nurse and then their GP who aren't and their psychologist, and the three aren't necessarily talking to each other. So collaborative. Um, keeping each other in the loop, um, working out um, collaborative management plans. I think that the GP plays a very important role in being there in a sense as the anchor of the base and being able to do some um, very good supportive strategy and depending on their skill more than that. And, um, and it's a question of um, using the other professionals as you need, like, oh, I wonder if I uh, need more of an assessment on this or... Um, I think that um, it might be helpful to, um, for Stacey, for example, to, um, to, to get some very uh, focused help with behavioural techniques for her anxiety. So um, it's about making suggestions and keeping the lines of communication open and vice versa. Psychologists really need to um, give very brief but constant feedback to, their, um, to, to general practitioners and nurses so that everyone's in the loop and we are working together to support um, a woman, Stacey. Thank you very much, Jeanette and Morton. Um, Stacey, I, I believe you had um, a question for Brian around medications. Uh, yes, Brian, I was just wondering um, more so, um, I think from my experience, I had um, attempted to, to take medication previously, but I always had... Um, side effects, headaches, um, you know, all of those sorts of things. So I gave up on medication um, and it wasn't until um, I was in the mother and baby unit that I found one that, um, that suited me. So I was wondering, um, and through my work with Panda, I also find women that um, sort of have to change medications because um, they, they're either not working or they don't agree with them. So my question is, um, what happens when um, a woman tries a number of medications or treatments um, with no success? Is there um, always an alternative or at some point is there a, a time when um, a woman has to find alternative treatment other, to medic uh, other than medication? Um, what medication were you on, Stacey? Um, initially, I oh, look, I tried a number. I tried Zoloft. I tried... Um, Cipramil, I tried. Um, oh, I, can't, I, I tried a number of different ones. Um, Arapax, I tried all of them, and they all pr um, presented with the same side effects. So, a dreadful um, head pressure and that sort of thing. Um, 
So I just gave up on them because I, I would give them long enough to work, you know, a good two, three weeks, um, but the, the side effects were really quite unbearable. Um, and, and I'm currently on um, Lexapro, which is the one that I've been on since I had Jake, and um, I've had no problems on that one. So it's, I was a, just, it's a newer yeah. version of one of the ones you had before, all of which are in the same group, but in fact, um, just because one of them doesn't suit someone doesn't mean one can't try another one. There are other medications that I, I might have tried, but um, we need to be thinking here that your diagnosis is not just postnatal depression here. We've got an anxiety disorder, so we definitely need something for the anxiety. Most antidepressants are also quite good for anxiety, but a lot of women are a little intolerant of that particular group of medications, which are called uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, because um, they do provide nausea and headache and so on, especially to begin with. And I think often people are not uh, uh, careful enough to start on a very small dose and let the woman get a little bit used to the medication before you increase to the, to the standard dose. Mm -hmm. Now, medication by itself is never enough. That's one of my hobby horses. So that um, if you offer or insist on medication before the woman trusts you and you have a therapeutic alliance with her, she's going to get side effects and it isn't going to work. Um, okay, yeah. so I think it's very important to build up the relationship, use medication appropriately if you have to, and to remember all the other things you need to put in place. And it's, it's not been my experience that people need several iterations of medication. Uh, usually the first one seems to be all right. So it, it, to some extent, I think it's, it's to do with the therapeutic alliance and, and what the woman um, is willing to try. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm very conservative about medication. If I can manage without it then, and just uh, doing psychotherapy, then that's what we do. Thank okay. you. Morton, I, I get the feeling that you want to say something there. Yeah, look, I, I would just like to um, echo uh, what Brian was just saying there. I think the therapeutic relationship and the relationship between um, the patient and their doctor is really critical in uh, these areas, particularly around mental health. Um, I certainly also have had the same sort of experiences in that um, when you do uh, know the patient well and there is a trust relationship, things certainly go much more smoothly and more, I think, comfortably for the patient than where you are looking at uh, a more episodic uh, emergency tri type uh, relationship which um, can sometimes be very difficult uh, both for the clinician and also for the patient to get the most out of, the, out of that relationship. So I think it's important for uh, us as clinicians and GPs particularly because we tend to have more of a long-term relationship with our, our patients um, to make sure that we do maintain that relationship through thick and thin. And That's, that is interesting, actually. May I just may I just jump in there? Yeah, um, sure. I just like I just like to ask Brian a question. It, it's and and some of our attendees have have touched on this in their questions. It seems to me as if the person who's got the least time with Stacey has got the most contact with her. That's the GP. Uh, can Brian? Can you can you think of any way that we can all collaborate better um, in the care of Stacey? Well, I suppose this is this is one of the things that um, is a, again a particular hobby horse of mine. I spend my my life trying to get people to collaborate. But w one of the the ways that that I do it is by making sure that all the people we see have a GP referral and that I'm in close touch with the GP and. It is important to remember, as Morton said, that long after they've finished seeing me, patients will be going back to their general practitioner. A problem we have um, in some of the areas where I work is that unlike in Britain, people don't have to have a GP allocated and stick with that person, and they can often hop from GP to GP, which means that nobody 
has the previous history of this person. Now, I don't see that you can do a great deal in five to ten minutes unless you have got that history uh, already at your fingertips. I mean, one of the advantages of general practice is that presumably you already know the patient and the family, and if you don't, then you're certainly behind the eight ball. But I, I don't see why, in fact, um, if a woman is pregnant, uh, the nurse in the practice can't ask her some questions and the way the midwife would do at the hospital and give her an, an Edinburgh perinatal depression scale to complete. Some of that can be done outside the GP's time, and the GP and, and the nurse can have a look at the results if they wish. It occurred to me, listening to Stacey, that she'd possibly been a private patient. Yes, that's correct. Yes, and you see, that, that is, is a hazard at the moment, and we're only just beginning to get the system of doing the psychosocial assessment and depression into the private system. Uh, it, they have been rather far behind in this. The public system, it's happening in most places. The private system, it's only just beginning. Some yes, of there is, there is work the, mostly with a midwife, but others don't. Yes, there is that, that peculiar dysfunction now, isn't there? Yes, but we are making a little progress. Good. Now, Jeanette, I believe you had a question from Morton around about uh, depression and postnatal depression tools for, for use in practice. Um, yes, and if I, if I can just lead off from the discussion right now, I think that uh, another quite helpful um, tool that uh, we sometimes, um, when we um, refer to women who are uh, from a GP and then we assess her, then we will uh, create a little card that we call, you know, collaborative networking amongst health professionals where we write down the names of all the professionals and we ask her to bring that along to each professional appointment so everyone knows who everybody else is and there's some communication happening. Um, what I was going to ask um, you, Morton, is um, in terms of GP practice, you know, what are the ways in which you find the most helpful way of identifying women with depression and, you know, and uh, I'm always curious about what is the best support that we can offer to GPs in the identification and screening of women um, because, you know, there, there, there are GPs like yourself who are very well versed in this and there are others who, who may not have as much experience. Um, so I was just wondering about your thoughts about how to best, uh, how you think GPs best go about identifying it as a routine exercise. Sure, thanks for the question. I mean, I, I think um, general practice has uh, uh, lots of um, challenges, shall we say, and one is, uh, you know, having the right tools at our fingertips at the right times. Um, one of the problems is that certainly making sure that uh, we're teaching our GP registrars about using uh, proper screening tools is really important. Um, I freely admit that when I was trained, no such thing existed for general practice, um, and it was uh, learning how to do it on the, on the job. Um, that's a little different now, and we're certainly more aware of uh, using uh, various scales. I mean, the, the K10 is probably the most commonly used in general practice, but not specific for perinatal. Um, and uh, certainly many of us are also using the Edinburgh scale uh, who have interests in uh, and seeing lots of uh, women uh, with, with uh, the perinatal uh, period. Um, the computerized technology that we now have allows us to have some drop-down menus and things like that, which has made a big difference. And then it's about educating GPs, uh, making sure that uh, we're not staying, uh, um, you know, back 10 years ago, um, just as it is. I mean, things change, uh, and we have to change with it. Um, I think critically, though, it's important to make sure that you listen to your patient well and you can certainly do that in a 10 minute and uh, acknowledge that if you have concerns um, bringing that patient back sooner rather than later certainly not leaving them 
uh, hanging for 12 weeks until the obstetrician sees them is really important and certainly with most of my uh, young mums and young ladies who are pregnant I make the point that I'm very happy to see them sooner rather than later and my girls in my practice know that um, they can get in uh, at a priority if they so demand it. Um, so it's about setting up your practice uh, as well as having the right screening tools. Thank you very much, Jeanette and Morton. Stacey, I believe um, that you had a question for Jeanette around about accessing or benefiting from psychological therapies when you feel that you may be too unwell to do so. Um, yes, which, which leads me back to, to my point when I was in fact um, admitted to the mother and baby unit in such a, a severe state that I, I really felt that I was incapable of engaging in, in any treatment because um, I was that unwell. So that was where my question came from, that, that can psychological treatment be beneficial if, if that biological or that um, chemical imbalance is, is too far out of control? Thanks, Stacey. I, um, there's a lot of questions packed in there, uh, you know, about um, um, both the severity of how you're feeling and um, and also, you know, what, what is causing it. But I think that uh, we have psychologists who work both in mother-baby units and then on discharge. And the sort of support that psychologists could give a mum um, would be different when she's in her most unwell state and it might be much more as um, Morton and Brian were talking about about forming support a relationship engaging in a trusting relationship to try to um, um, help with feelings of fear and safety and not actually starting the very focused work that's only perhaps possible once you're feeling a little more in control mm -hmm. because as I said before we understand and, and as Brian said that it's not just a biological event, you know. There, there's things psychologically happening in your family, in relationships, in how you feel. The best approach is to um, always consider um, help at every level. So I think the short answer is that um, you wouldn't attempt an intensive psychological treatment of um, trying to uh, teach someone um, cognitive strategies of how to challenge um, intrusive thoughts when you're very unwell, but you could very much help with some supportive behavioural strategies um, to, to, to and, and forming a relationship so that um, uh, you would have had a good experience whilst in the inpatient unit of feeling supported mm. and cared for and, um, and contained which, and with the particular issues you're facing at that time. Thanks, mm -hmm. Jeanette. Brian, would you like to comment on, on that? Um, well, I, I'm not sure that, that there's uh, a lot I can add, actually, to, to what's been said. I, I think that if you're in the hospital, you're sick enough probably to need medication, and that the medication should be sorted out and the patient uh, should have adequate rest before any other work is expected of her. And if, in fact, uh, she hasn't been well enough to engage in any psychological treatments before she's discharged, then I, I wonder why she's being discharged. I would like her to be attached to various services before she leaves the hospital. I want to know that all this has been set up for her and her family. Either she returns as an outpatient to our service or we've made contact with other services and, and linked her in. And she should certainly not be going home as feeling as bad as or even worse than when she uh, was admitted to the hospital. We seem to, it just, and, and this has come through from some of our, from some of our attendees, we seem to have um, left out some important people in, in the care of, of, um, of antenatal and, and um, postnatal patients, uh, of obstetricians, midwives. Would anybody like to comment uh, well, I have on their role? already commented to some extent in that um, some obstetricians are very keen on 
psychosocial assessments and depression screening being done. They don't necessarily do it themselves, although some of them do, but they expect that when the, the woman books in at the hospital, she will be asked these questions and they will be told the results and they will make sure that referrals are made for support for this woman. It's another of my mantras is that a well-trained midwife, and similarly postnatally a child and family health nurse, a well-trained midwife is an intervention. If the woman sees this midwife, uh, perhaps on several occasions, trusts her and the midwife takes an interest in her, that, that makes a huge change to the woman's anxiety level and her confidence in what that midwife might suggest. And if the midwife says, look, you, you had a bad time last time, why don't we link you in with a psychiatrist now so that we have a plan? That way we can avoid you getting sick again. By this stage, hopefully the woman trusts the midwife well enough to say, okay, um, I'll see someone that, that uh, you can recommend to my GP. Thank you. Morton, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, look, I think um, uh, Grant's absolutely right. I think there are, uh, uh, just as there are GPs with different interests within, the, uh, within general practice, there are also obstetricians with different interests in their practice. And I certainly know uh, several obstetricians who, if I have a lady who I am concerned about in terms of her uh, mental health history or her mental health at the time, I will be recommending um, who have really good at, uh, abilities to talk and, and collaborate with other mental health pro professionals. There are several, uh, just as I'm sure uh, there are, there are um, uh, GPs who uh, Stacey probably wouldn't recommend. Um, you know, I think it's, it's important to, if you're not getting the response that you want from your health professional, to look for another opinion um, or um, sort of make that known to your professional uh, so that some of those issues can be worked through. Thanks, Morton. Just, uh, Jeanette, may I just ask you a question? Many of our practitioners um, um, are from rural areas and regional areas where um, they may not have access to the luxury of a mother and baby unit. Um, do you have any take-home messages for the practitioners attending tonight? Just a sort of a you know, quick five or a quick ten or a quick six? Jeanette? Oh, um, yes, and if I could just add something to the previous question, because we haven't talked enough about nurses. I think nurses, uh, we're very privileged in Australia to have a very good um, maternal and child health nurse, as we call them, Victoria, or similar in other states uh, system, and, um, and midwives also play a pivotal role. And we certainly have found that not only are they important because they're in contact with new mothers, but we've trained um, nurses um, and found uh, nurses to be able to provide for mild to moderate um, postnatal depression very effective care. So, um, you know, I think that there's another resource there um, in our primary care network. And when we talk about um, the problems of um, rural areas, of, um, of, of the extent, if, uh, given we've got a national perinatal depression initiative that wants to try and up the screening so all women are screened, we mm. need to find ways of reaching women when there aren't many resources. Yes. But to answer your question about the rural in a roundabout way, I think that we have to um, uh, use our primary care professionals that exist and train them up, at, but also be aware of when it gets beyond their level of expertise and requires onward referral to one of their colleagues. So if there's a, a, a good knowledge of that, I think we can um, use a broader range of professionals and we're certainly exploring other mediums for intervention um, as well as, um, so for example, you know, we ourselves are, are develop, developing an online uh, training program supported by telephone counselling. Good. That's good. And um, do you have any comments at all on that, Stacey, what you're hearing, what you've heard over the last five or ten minutes? Any comments? 
Yeah, look, I, I think um, particularly for for, for rural uh, women in in the area that I work in, which is in fact um, telephone counselling helpline, um, we're commonly presented with the fact that that there appears to be a lack of resources, or these women um, are unable to link in with appropriate resources. So. For, for these women, we actually find that, um, that online support services um, are extremely useful and with a service such as Panda2, we're hopefully able to provide a link to these women with um, a database that we can provide. So, uh, look, I think overall, um, basically what, what I'm hearing here is that there is um, what I would consider to be a limited um, network of professionals in this, in this area. When you look at the number of women that become pregnant um, versus the number of, of professionals dealing specifically or with, with a specific interest in perinatal depression, um, you can certainly see where the gap is. So the obvious, um, the obvious question that I pose is, is how do women access um, the, the people such as Brian and such as, as Jeanette when, when people with such expertise and, and such a specific interest in this area are so limited. Thank you. Now, we're just, unfortunately, time always, always runs by too quickly when, when you're engaged. Um, Brian, we allowed you not to ask any questions in this segment, but I'm going to ask you to ask one of your fellow panellists one question that's occurred to you during this webinar. If, if you were allowed to make one change to our health system to assist women with perinatal depression and I insist perinatal anxiety, what would that change be? Because from my point of view, we no sooner train up lots of midwives who are excellent, lots of child and family health nurses who are excellent, and the numbers are cut back and they can't do all the things they're mandated to do. And it seems to me that if, if these professionals are well trained, they're a wonderful resource. We need more of them. Mm. Morton, would you like to address that? Um, yeah. Look, I, I mean, I think that certainly from a general practice perspective, I think it's about uh, education, uh, reminding GPs of the importance of this area. Um, as as we've said before, this is only part of what a GP does. Um, uh, so it's important to keep that in their front of their mind. Uh, and that's probably the, the main thing uh, that I'd suggest, education and keeping, keeping them informed. Jeanette, I can give you 38 seconds to speak. <laughs> no, I'd agree with everything that's been... <laughs> And I'd also like to say that, you know, that families and supportive communities and social networks, we haven't talked a lot about that, no. but that's very, very, you know, important and uh, has been shown to, um, you know, reduce severity and, and reduce the time of um, suffering. So I'd say, yes, let's train up as many people as we can and be creative in developing and researching a broader range of, of services that can be done more remotely. And never forget that a group of women getting together is a wonderful resource. Yes, yes, definitely. Excellent. I'm, I'm glad somebody said that. I, I, I think women getting together and I think um, people talking at their problems in their own settings is, is very useful therapy, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of this webinar. We had nearly a 1,000 people apply to uh, participate in, in the webinar. Uh, and we have had 250 um, log in. I'd like to thank all of all of the attendees for logging in, um, and I trust that you will continue to access the MHPN website uh, for further conversation around this topic. Uh, we didn't get a chance to, to talk about all of the uh, uh, therapists who can be engaged in this area, particularly with um, mental health nurses, and we probably didn't cover sufficiently um, uh, maternal and child nurses, and I apologize for that. Um, I am a GP, and I have learned a lot tonight. Um, I think it's a very important area. Um, it's probably our only biological function uh, is to reproduce, 
So we need to make sure that those who do the most work, um, the mothers, um, all our mothers and all our daughters, get good care during this time. And I would hope that this webinar will raise um, the issues that we've discussed tonight more broadly throughout Australia and throughout all the marvellous therapists who've attended tonight. Um, I feel very humbled, uh, Stacey, having listened to your story, um, and I cannot tell you how much we all appreciate how bravely uh, you articulated that. And I'm going to leave the last word to you. I normally have the last word, Stacey, because <laughs> you can have the last word tonight. Um, I think, again, I push for, um, for early intervention and the opportunity um, to be given, um, for women to be given permission to say that, that something's not right and um, to be listened to and heard. I think, you know, there still is a stigma um, with mental health and particularly when um, it, it's such an experience that is anticipated and, and projected as meant, meant to be a wonderful, joyous time. So I think that perhaps um, by just being given permission to say everything's not as good as what it should be, um, I think would allow for that early intervention and, and so much work could be done to prevent um, the experience that I went through. Thank you very much, Stacey. And on behalf of everybody, I would like to thank all of our panellists. I'd like to thank Brian and Morton and Jeanette. Um, and last but certainly not least, Stacey, for, for her articulation tonight. Thank I you. wish you all well, and, and I trust that we will see you all again at some stage on one of our webinars from MHPN. Thank you all. Have a safe trip home if you're traveling home. Sleep well. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good night.